the half mile racing is just like a, a bragging rights of who's got the highest speed at the end of it when when drag racing is who's who's beating you to the end. Welcome along to another episode of the HPA Tuned In podcast. Now, on the podcast this time, we have Miles Kerr from English Racing. Miles is a build consultant in English Racing. We'll find out as we talk to Miles what that term actually means, but he's probably best known for his green DC2 Honda Integra that he uses for both half mile and quarter mile racing. Probably getting up there as one of the more powerful B series engines around. Uh, currently making around 1400 wheel horsepower at about 70 psi of boost. So safe to say it's no slouch. Uh, we go into a lot of detail with Miles in particular around the reliability of these engines. Uh, we talk about the 4B11 as well and some of the aspects of sleeving technology and also head gasket integrity, which I know from my history in drag racing becomes a real limiting factor with high boost turbocharged engines tim what, what did you reckon of that interview what did you take away from it yeah we certainly covered a lot of ground there but one of the things i found really interesting was them talking about their some of their tuning strategies to limit the amount of traction control intervention they need to use which was you know quite interesting to me just actually you know coming from the side of more preventing the traction uh, attraction problem in the first place and not having to sort of rely too much on those electronic aids yeah i think it, it does obviously depend on the engine and we could probably uh, lean pretty heavily on traction control in engines that aren't making very high specific power levels but uh, as we'll talk about in the in the podcast uh, as those power levels climb you do get to a situation where uh, the traction control can actually end up doing damage to engine components so sure. uh, something that I think a lot of people may overlook definitely uh, before we jump into the podcast, just wanted to discuss one of our Instagrams over on the HPA 101 Instagram. If you aren't following us, uh, please make sure you do. We post some pretty interesting content uh, all the time and uh, always interested to see our comments on that. Now, this one was uh, a photo uh, that we took when we were at PRI a few years back and it's of a piston that's been created using uh 3D printing, additive manufacturing, and generative design. And it got a lot of engagement, particularly a lot of people uh, saying that they wouldn't trust that piston as far as they could kick it and uh, doesn't look safe. Uh, Tim, from your background, you know a little bit about 3D printing and additive manufacturing. You're a mechanical engineer. Uh, how does this technology really pan out? Okay, can we trust it? Yeah, there's a couple of things here. One is the design process, and the second is the manufacturing. So the first part, the, the design is probably the most interesting part of this where essentially what you're doing is giving uh, the computer a set of constraints. You say, I want this part to be this big. You say, these features are the parts that are important to me. We cannot modify these features, but this bounding box or this area of the part, you can do whatever you want. And these are the forces that it's going to be subjected to. And essentially it's giving you the ideal uh, mechanical design to be usually you want to minimize mass, you might want to minimize things like inertia, depending on what the part is. Uh, and you say, you know, these are the constraints, show me what the optimum is. And this is the outcome of that. And as long as your constraints are good, then theoretically, this should work, but it's garbage in, garbage out, no, same old story. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's no magic here. And I think as well, it's really hard to get a solid read on this. Uh, the information for the current crop of F1 cars is very sketchy, so I, I take it with a grain of salt, but there was an article that uh, Ferrari were using uh, additive manufacturing for the pistons in their engines. Obviously, with uh, those engines, the cylinder pressures are immense, and anything they can do to get a gain in terms of uh, weight versus strength is obviously key for sure and i mean additive manufacturing is just one of those technologies that's really just accelerated so quickly over the last particularly in the last 10 years you know 10 years ago we were using it a lot for prototyping you know more for just understanding how things were going to fit together in a real situation whereas now you know building functional components and even highly stressed components like this is becoming much much more practical so i've got no doubt there's some people out there doing some really interesting stuff with it 
Yeah, I, I think it, it's fair to say that this technology is, while it's developed, is still probably in its infancy. So it's really interesting to see what's going to come of this over the next five to, to 10 years. No doubt it's going Absolutely. to have a bigger influence on, on what we're doing. Uh, now, before we jump into the podcast as well, uh, we've just talked about uh, pistons there. So for those of you who are interested in engine building, just understand that at HPA, we do offer a full suite of engine building courses. Perfect for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about the fundamentals or the practical aspects aspects of building engines and as part of that you can use the coupon code podcast 75 at checkout that's going to give you 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course Alrighty, let's bring in our guest well, welcome to the podcast to miles and miles thanks for for joining us uh, could you maybe give people who haven't heard of you and your Integra uh, a real quick rundown on, on, on what, what you do and, and what your Integra is? Yeah, so my name is Miles Kerr. I work for English Racing here in Camas, Washington, and I've been here just 10 years, about a, about a month ago, and uh, I bought the Integra 100% stock in 2006, and literally every nut and bolt on the car I've, I've touched at one point all the way up to now it's a all wheel drive 1400 horsepower car. So, I mean, uh, it's been 213 and a half miles so far. It's trapped 183 and a quarter miles so far. And, and, um, I mean, it's, I drive it to Starbucks, I drive it around. It's kind of one of those stupid things that you shouldn't drive on the street, but I've, <laughs> I've, I've got to push those limits and that's what I do. So I see from your Instagram stories, you spend probably about as much time at Starbucks as you do in, in English racing, racing in the shop. I, I would say it's a pretty, pretty comparable there for sure. All right. So l let's just start by talking just briefly about what you actually do at, at English racing. Uh, and I wasn't too sure you sort of customer service, but you actually called yourself a build cons consultant. I think that's, what? Yeah, I think uh, if you call English Racing, I'm going to be the first one that picks up the phone. So kind of your first point of contact, the first person you see when you walk in the shop. And uh, I mean, I know everything from how to build a car, what it takes to build an Evo, a Supra, a GTR, kind of any combo really, all the way up to, you know, I mean, we've got cars that are making 25, 2600 horsepower now. So, you know, you call us with a dream or just you want your car aligned or an oil change done, I can set up the schedule. Or if you say, no, I'm really serious. I want to go race my car. Then I ask how serious they are about really racing their car. Are you ready for all the breakage? Are you ready for all this stuff? And I, what you're meaning blunt. is how, how deep is the wallet? How deep is the wallet? Yeah. How, how fast do you want to go? And do you understand, are you ready for the breakage? Are you ready to sit in a, in a line for four hours at tx 2 k because 10 people oil down the track, you know, and are you ready for that? And you really find out real quick how serious someone is or not. And that's, you know, I'm not going to say that I turn everyone down or I turn everyone away, but the people who are truly serious, they're, they're going to get into it, you know, and the people who are just like, I think I just want a 500 horsepower car. How do I get there? Cool. I can help you with that too. And and, you know, these days anyone can find information online and a lot of people can purchase parts from pretty much anywhere. Uh, the way we work at it is if you're coming to me and you're coming to us for our service and who we are, I'm going to give you that guarantee that this car is going to make X power. And but I'm not going to give you that parts list ahead of time so that you can just go purchase it from everywhere else. Because, you know, we we're in a business for a service slash tuning and building, not really a parts sales place like a you know, certain other companies that just sell parts, you know, so um, we know what it takes with pretty much any Evo 8, 9, 10, a Supra, a GTR, and even a Honda now, what it takes to make X power. And we're just not going to give you that shopping list until at least we've got a deposit down of getting going on a build. So um, I think that may be the, the easiest way to explain kind of what I do. I think it's a situation that's become so prevalent. I mean, I saw it during my own uh, business as well, STM, and you'd have customers that obviously, and and I understand they want to save save a dollar. Correct. But, yes. But you know that that parts list shopping, like, okay, give me your ten years of experience. What parts do I need on this car to do the job? Yeah, great. Exactly. Thanks for that. Now I'm going to go and, and get those cheaper off Amazon or yes. eBay. And, or, and then or, I'm going to go back to you. Yeah. And have you install them all? 
And then I'm going to be butthurt when it doesn't make the same power that you told me it would make. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. it's it's 100%. a weird situation that we see over and over again in the industry. And I think and, you know, people do need to appreciate that the reason you can guarantee a number is because you have that 10 years of experience developing and yeah. all of that takes yeah. time and it takes money. And that's really what you're paying for, not the probably 10% markup on some of the parts anyway. You're not probably getting rich on, on selling a wastegate or a blow no, valve. We're not. We're not. I mean, really, the, the majority of the margin is in our labor and our service and our tuning. The part sales are really just, I mean, let's call it realistic, you know, 10 to 15% on the majority of the parts out there, unless you're manufacturing something yourself, you make your own parts, you you know, like ETS, Extreme Turbo Systems, like decent margins for like building certain things. And then certain margins, they're really low because they have to be competitive in certain areas. So um, with us, you know, our motors are not the cheapest out there. They're probably the most expensive, but you're going to get our years of experience to guarantee that it's going to do exactly what we say it's going to do. Yeah, I think there's a saying out there when you pay good money for a part or an engine for this case, you only have to cry once. As opposed you only to cry <laughs> once. And the amount of people that I, of cars that are in the back parking lot, I think we have like 47 cars here right now. I would say five cars out there have paid twice now. Yeah, and that sounds like a relatively a low percentage, lower percentage it, than I was expecting. Well, I mean, it's hard to well, learn those lessons. I can think of five names right offhand that I know for <laughs> sure are in it a second time, but there's probably more out there that have gone through a couple scenarios of paying. I mean, I've got one car out there that came to us last year with an 800 horsepower goal and an Evo 10. And, you know, people think Evo 10s, they make power, but they don't stay together very well um, between the narrow rod bearings they have and head gasket issues. If the sleeves aren't done correctly, I mean, there's a lot of things into an Evo 10 that not a lot of people, you know, they're like, oh, we built four G63s, we know how to do this. Well, you do to an extent, but they are very different engines at 800 and above. And so I had this customer come in, he's like, he had called us a year prior and spoke to one of the other gentlemen who worked here before. Um, and he was like, why do you want to build an 800 horse Evo 10? Are you sure you want to do that? Like, and he got a very bad vibe from him. Um, and so what ended up happening was, is he went and went somewhere else that made him feel all warm and fuzzy about this 800 horse build and it spun a bear, spun spun the main line on the dyno while it was making 710 wheel and so he had just went through the entire build process there and here he is doing one of our first custom 2.2 liter strokers we did in the evo 10 where we took a a manly crank ground uh some stroke out of it did the wider bearing that we do in the drag car in the drag 10 and so it's kind of best of both worlds that we feel because they're, they're kind of laggy when they're a two liter, you know? And so we've got this custom one. He's the first one that's got it. And you know, it's a, it's a really expensive motor because you're taking a $1,500 crank, then you're putting another thousand dollars at, at this company that, 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 you know, takes the stroke out of the crank and they grind the bear, you know? So yeah, it's almost $3,000 in a crank that we could have had maybe someone do a crank for us at one point. So you know, it's a pretty expensive motor. And so it's just in the process now. We just installed the Motec on it. And, but yeah, it took a year to get all these custom parts done for this car and hear this guy, you know, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think people maybe appreciate how much time and, and the money goes into some of these custom parts. A, a little off topic, yeah. but seeing as you've brought it up, obviously the, the 4B11, the natural sort yeah. of, uh, younger brother, I guess, to the 4G63, which we all mm -hmm. know and love. And yeah. uh, uh, technically, arguably, a superior engine. Uh, certainly, they seem to make uh, more power, arguably, for the same turbo and boost pressure. But they you've do. gone from a cast iron block to an alloy block, and you've sort of just insinuated mm -hmm. there there's a couple of problems. Uh, obviously, with alloy blocks, at that sort of power level, very high power level sleeving, which is something I really wanted to talk about anyway. So maybe mm -hmm. we'll get to that mm -hmm. a bit earlier than, than yeah. I'd expected. Uh, and you've talked about these narrow rod bearings. Now, that's something that a lot of people don't really appreciate as a potential limiting factor slash failure point. So can you talk us through what you mean by a narrow rod bearing and what, why that is a problem? Yeah, so, I mean, I look at it like a sharp point versus a dull point trying to stick a knife into someone. The, there's more surface area on the, 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 the wider bearing, and it's more, I guess you maybe call it crush for for 
more area to uh it's like a uh, surface pressure thing surface pressure thing yeah so we've got more bearing we've got more more oil more rod more everything um that uh on the narrow bearings you don't have and i mean we went through motor after motor in the beginning and uh, really it got to the point on our drag car um when we got to like you know over a thousand horsepower i would say we were going through rod bearings i would say probably over 10 passes going through stuff and so and then we actually what happened too is we bent a rod we bent a, an r and r rod like you know probably like a 15 degree angle and we were like huh so you know we call we call grp because we switched to grp and we're like hey we need to build a you know he's like oh what happened we're like oh we bent the rod but like the engine was fine like there was no failure point like nothing happened it just you know an so you RST got away with it. power yeah we got away with it didn't find its way through the block and so we get a hold of them and we're like he's like oh yeah it's got a they call it a window it's got a windowed uh, aluminum rod not a solid beam right. and so you know he's like you need a solid beam all right cool can you make that he's like no I'm like, well, what do you mean he's like well for one there's not enough uh there's not enough clamp for the bigger rod bolt that they're going to need with the smaller bearing and the the more weight they're going to add to the to the um the more weight they're going to add to the to the rod itself so i'm like so what do we need to do he's like you need to cut the journal down on the rod so that we can put a smaller bearing in it as far as diameter and also it's a smaller journal in diameter and a wider bearing so just just getting that wider uh bearing wider bearing so yeah the increase in surface area so that's sort of correct the the the, the trick or secret to getting the full bear levens to be reliable was, at that sort of power level it, it was one of the things we noticed yeah i mean and we don't we don't ever have bearing failures anymore. There's not a, there's not a, Oh, well we ran out, you know, we smoked a bearing. We, we don't go through that anymore. We've, we've gotten that part situated. We don't bend rods. We don't go through that. And, you know, now at, at our level at the Evo 10 valve, you know, head gaskets were a problem. Cause we used to just do a, um, um, we used to just do a step deck block. Um, mm -hmm. and then that became, now we have our own, custom stuff we do kind of like similar well, to what's in the integra let's just leave the head gasket off to one side because that's sure one of my personal pet peeves i've i've done more than my fair share of leaking head gaskets in 4g 63s mm -hmm. but that's mm -hmm. like a really a, a, a key part for these high boost engines keeping them yeah. together so we'll come yeah. back and talk about that separately but just while sure. we're, we're on yeah. the the rods so i, I remember yeah. at i think it was pike speak yes strip attack and i was speaking to jr from ets about yes, their, yep. their their uh gtr drag car mm -hmm. well Mm -hmm. half mile car and um yep. I, I think there's just the stuff that people don't understand i think at the time that was circa 3000 wheel horsepower and he was telling me that uh, basically the best of the best crankshaft i uh, may be uh mistaken ten, yeah exactly 10 passes yep. but that was yep. the best crankshaft money can buy and yep. 10 passes throw it in the bin at, at maybe four five six thousand dollars i'm not even quite sure probably more than that yeah, actually well, you know one of the things on that is i don't think we've ever even us now, and, and I, I think they go in the cars, they make the power and they're cracked already, but they yeah. just stay together. I, I've never seen one break into one of the Bryant cranks, you know, that they use. I've never seen one break into, but if you magna flux it, it's got a crack every single time. That's the problem with any of those parts though. As soon as you, you do that magna flux test and crack test and you know it's got a crack, we've had the same with gear sets. It probably cracked, like you say, maybe the burnout or the first pass, but- Who knows, or on the dyno long, when it makes yeah. 2000, but how long, how long is it gonna long hold together? Exactly, so that's one of those things is you're like, am I really gonna put this 50, $60,000 motor together with a $5,000 crank that I could just put a new one in? So, you know, ETS has literally uh, uh, probably a room full of these cranks that are just nothing, you know, and, and, and I've seen the room and, and I've seen the amount of, we have the same amount for 4B11 stuff, yeah. but they have a lot of uh, GRP, Carrillo, rods and a lot of uh cranks brain cranks it's an expensive uh, car part yeah. symmetry I, I think if if i came back to my my own evo drag racing days with the earlier 4g 63 the the uh, evo one to three spec and we we were using billet cranks and we would mm -hmm. spend four thousand dollars on a billet crank and pull it out after you know half a season for a freshen up crack test it the thing was cracked yep 
yep, yep. we ended up resorting to the same the factory crankshaft because yep. they would also crack but we're paying i can't even remember like now a thousand fifteen yeah a thousand yeah, bucks maybe yeah. for a crank Cheap. Yeah, so uh, people sort of, I don't think they appreciate just how good those factory components are, being that they are forged from the factory. Uh, yeah. they're, they're a quality item and you know, I certainly never had one actually fall to pieces. I just, just wanted to quickly come back because we sort of touched on that VR38 and the, the ETS car. But I think yeah. one of the things that, that sort of affected there, it really talks into the story that you've got here about the rod bearing. On those V6s, particularly the, the crankshaft journals for the, the rods, you, you don't have that luxury of being able to make them wider. So that, that's a sort of inherent flaw at that sort of power level with, with the VR38. Yeah, so I think ETS actually does a big block Chevy rod journal on those. Okay. So right. they I don't I don't know if they widen them or, or what they do, but uh, ETS did it back in the day, I think, because they said the availability of the parts would be a lot easier for the big block Chevy rod journals. Yeah, And in the end, it sounds like it was also probably a strength thing too. Gotcha. And now every crank you buy from pretty much any manufacturer, T1, AMS, they all have the same recipe, big block Chevy rod journals in them now. Yeah, everyone sort of stumbled upon the same same solution to, to this they, problem. There were people making fun of ETS about their uh, uh, Chevy rod journal crank back in the day, like when they first did it. And it's kind of one of the industry standards now in the GTR that all of them do that. So I would say that ETS did a lot of stuff in the beginning that like, it was like thinking like, oh, that's a really dumb idea. But it, it, you know, they got bit at one point with like, you know, they, they had the cable throttle bodies with a car that's a drive by wire car and they have the throttle bodies hidden with no, with nothing just being ghosted basically. So, you know, they, They've done stuff like that that, you know, most people were like, ah, it's a bad idea. But when you're having throttle body problems shutting you down 130 feet out of the quarter mile and you're about to have a record pass and you keep getting shut down, GR was really good about like, well, we're going to do this even though we know it can cause problems because uh, you don't have any torque reduction without throttle. So, sure. it, you know, he's gone through a fair amount of stuff to, to get there, but... You know, it was. It, I think that car still has cable th or cable throttle bodies on it till today. Yeah, yeah, I remember seeing yeah. that as well. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll we'll get back to to English racing stuff and particularly yeah, your yeah. Integra. A little bit of a sidetrack there for the yeah, the GTR no stuff, but um, I, it sort of also talks to another point that I want to discuss, which was reliability for these high horsepower cars. And I think, you know, the sort of numbers you're talking. Your fourteen hundred wheel uh, and the GTRs as well, two and a half, three thousand wheel. Uh, people hear these sort of numbers thrown about, you know, relatively frequently now, and it sort of becomes a bit of a, a new norm. And people sort of think, oh, well, I can make fourteen hundred wheel horsepower out of my <laughs> B eighteen C, and uh, and it'll do a hundred thousand miles between freshen ups. The reality, though somewhat different can you give us a bit of perspective on that what do people really need to know i well i would say i'm kind of lucky right now the motor that's currently in my car is on its third season right now so i've almost say i probably on the opposite side that i would expect it to be i i pretty much expect it to go at any time at this power level uh now that it's putting more power down in second third and fourth being all-wheel drive uh before it would it'd be like a, let's call it a 1250, 1300 horsepower at the very top of the RPM. So it's like a very soft 1300 horsepower. Well, now I've changed the boost control strategy to where it's a very hard 1300 horsepower. So it's like, as soon as it can make full boost, it makes full boost and it's harder on it. So I've, I fully expect it to not survive as long as it has been. Um, but yeah, I mean, at this power level, you know, how hard are you on it? Are you doing half mile? Are you doing quarter mile? Because I think there's a, there's a difference between both of those. Definitely. Um, I would say the half mile is harder on the engines. The drag racing is harder on the hard parts like transmissions, axles, rear differentials. So the the half mile it's still a acceleration game, but it's not is it's not as much of an ET game. So it's not so critical. Your, your terminal speed through the traps at the end of a half mile is not as driven by how hard you get out of the hole basically that's what you're saying you don't have to launch the thing at 10 tenths like you would in a quarter mile correct yeah you don't have to launch it launching it does get it some mile an hour like probably three to two to three miles an hour versus rolling out versus yeah. launching it at least in my car because it's pretty laggy 
you know, I don't have like any boost to like, let's call it 6,000 RPM, 6,500, right? So uh, if I roll out in Colorado, it was worth three miles an hour versus launching it at 6,000 RPMs and just letting it ride the trash control in first gear. As someone so, who doesn't come from this sort of world of, of drag racing or half mile racing, could you just explain yeah. exactly the, the difference in that format? Uh, so uh, drag racing quarter mile, it's all about who gets to the finish line first. So you have a reaction time off the line and then who crosses the finish line first is who wins. Well, in the half mile racing that we do, it's who has the highest speed at the end of the track, at the end of the half mile that wins the race. And you could be side by side with someone and yeah, everyone wants to beat the other person. You want to beat the guy next to you, but you also want to be faster than him on the other end. So the half mile racing is just like a, a bragging rights of who's got the highest speed at the end of it. When, when drag racing is who's, who's beating you to the end. Got you. And those are probably the two fundamental differences. The other thing is half mile racing is all done on like airstrips, like airports. So there's, it's, it's, it's no prep when drag racing uh, that you're doing most of the time is fully prep drag strip rubber on the ground. You're racing on slicks of some sort. And the traction you can put down in first, second gear versus the half mile, it's a huge difference, like mm -hmm. a, a drastic difference. Does this make the, is, I know we're not going to get into chassis setup or anything, that, anything like that today, but you have to be a bit more versatile. You're having to, you know, if you're going to different, like these different surfaces and stuff on a, you're talking about airports or yeah. airstrips, like the from, mentality quite, maybe for a no prep. Strip. Totally. Like maybe, maybe it's more variable as far as setting the car it, up and stuff. It's probably, it's harder to put power down on a, it's basically just like the street. It's concrete, basically. Mm -hmm. It's grooved concrete. So it's just, and that's what you're putting the power down. To put it in the perspective, my car with a, uh, on the track last year, trapped almost 183 in the quarter mile. And when I ran 213, it only trapped 160 in the quarter mile. Yeah. So I'm losing 22 or three miles an hour in the first half. Yep. because of lack of traction i'm on trash control in through fourth gear so it's 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 not like destroying at trash control it's just like right on the edge of three uh, five to eight percent ten percent it'll it'll hit ten percent in certain areas so it's really all about traction and that's why all-wheel drive cars always go the fastest in a half mile because they have way more traction than a front wheel drive or a rear wheel drive car yeah so i would say you have to have a fast street car to go fast. And by fast street car, I mean on the street, it's fast on like your normal roadway mm -hmm. to uh, go fast. I just want to come back a little bit and, and dive into a term you use, which a lot of people may not have, have picked up. You, you, you talked about a soft 1300 horsepower yeah, versus, yeah. A, mm -hmm. a, I think you called it a, a hard 1300 horsepower. Now, a lot of people think, might be thinking to themselves, well, 1,300 horsepower is 1,300 horsepower, 30, yeah, yeah. But, but it isn't. So, so talk us through exactly what you meant by that in a bit more detail and how that affects the, the reliability of the engine parts. Yeah, so I guess, you know, we could, you know, uh, a hard, a, a soft 1,300 horsepower would be like I'm ramping the boost in as RPM goes. Yep. So it's, let's say it. 6,000 RPM, it's 20 pounds and it's 7,000 RPM, it's 25 and eight, it's 30, 35. So it's like a, it's like a, a straight line. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we always, we made the joke called the Honda power band because Honda, Honda's, if you're trying to make a car hook on the street, you can't have a Evo power band that can put everything down. You have yeah. to have a, a soft power band or a flat torque curve essentially is what it ends up being. Cause as RPM goes up, yeah. the power keeps going and your torque kind of maintains. And so that helps keep stuff, keep the tires from spinning, right? Obviously you can get into all the other torque control and all this other stuff, but in reality, it just comes down to controlling the tire and how much the tire can do uh, at, at a given speed and road, et cetera. So you're always fighting a traction, traction control issue on a front wheel drive car. Yep. And so the, the soft 1300 is it's, it's, a, it's 1300 at 10,500, right? And when my 1300 in the all wheel drive car now it's it's peak power at 8500 and it holds it till till just about 10,000 and it's so it's not, got a big meaty power band you're not ramping that boost in soft you basically want to hold that wastegate closed yeah. as long as you can get full boost as soon in the rev range as yes. the turbo's able and then hold yes. it you want the biggest power band you can get yeah. 
Now, I think this really sort of feeds into another thing about sort of engine building, engine reliability, and, and, and what you can expect from the engine. It's not really necessarily the power in and of itself that, that, that the, the engine has to support, but it's cylinder pressure, yeah. which is actually more to do with the torque curve. So we're going to have Correct. maximum cylinder pressure at peak torque. So what Correct. you're saying there by having that soft power curve, ramping the boost in slowly, what it does is artificially lower the peak torque value because you're not, you yep. don't have that big sort of uh, bulge in your torque curve and it, it drops away, you're sort of holding, as you said, Correct. that flat torque curve. So yeah. less cylinder pressure, easier on the engine components? I would say easier on the everything, engine, drivetrain, whatever you want to call it. It's easier on all of it because it's, it's, it's less. It's less torque sooner. So, you know, um, when like I, I'll send you the picture of what my dyno sheet looks like now versus what it looked like when it made like 1300 it's like it's pretty scary how much different it is i mean we're talking it's like 250 foot pounds 200 300 horsepower at like 7000 rpms higher now than it was it's not insignificant so i i hit the car a lot harder uh when i started drag racing it with a good tire yeah. because i couldn't hit it like that on a 245 45 16 toyo r88 right uh, when it was front wheel drive. So, um, yeah, I'd say the harder you hit it, the, the, the more power or torque sooner you hit it, the more hard it's the, like you said, peak cylinder pressure is going to be harder. You're going to hit everything harder components of all sorts. When you were talking, you know, staying with this description of soft versus hard power. And you said, you know, like particularly in a front wheel drive, you weren't really able to use a hard power strategy because yeah. you'd just be lighting the wheels up anyway. Correct. What does this mean in terms of you know, traction control differences? Like, why is it that you couldn't make use of effective traction control strategies with a, a hard tune or a hard style engine versus a soft? Obviously, there's a reason. So, what are some of the intricacies there? You just, you're, it's too much power for what you have, essentially. Um, so, you're always fighting traction. Go ahead. I think, I think probably. Uh, what we're always trying to do here, and this really goes for drag racing, or at least it was my philosophy, as well as circuit racing, is we don't want to be relying, like riding that traction control all Correct. of the time. And yeah. particularly in very high horsepower cars, it actually can be potentially damaging to the engine. We talked mm -hmm. to the guys from Proline, for example, and they want to make sure that they're, they're not having any cuts occur because it can damage components quite okay. quickly. So that's, so that's it, an interesting, it's, because I've always... You go. We'll, we'll circle back yeah, on let's that. Come back to that. A, so yeah. basically what we want to try and do is, is taper or tailor the, the torque delivery of the engine to the amount of traction we've got available. Mm -hmm. And then we're just kind of using that uh, traction control in the background as a bit of a, a safety backstop in case we get it a bit wrong. Because we're always pushing the limits, right, Miles? So yep. you know, yep. run by run, we're, we're always tweaking boost curves and, and power levels mm -hmm. so that we're trying to optimize the, the amount of traction that the track gives. And that also develops over a race weekend as well. But yep. sometimes we might overstep the mark and that's when we've got that traction control just to make sure that we're not going to end up facing the star line. <laughs> so but yeah. e even without the reliability perspective there of, of being hard on engine components you're saying it's still from a performance perspective you're still better off not relying on those electronics well there's an argument for that which is interesting because mm -hmm. we we know obviously there's a lot into this depending on the specifics of the tire you will get maximum acceleration with a small amount of slip. a little bit of Correct. So yes. te yeah. technically, uh, some traction control intervention. Miles, you're talking six or eight percent. So obviously, uh, for me, obviously it varies per gear because ten yeah. percent at 180 miles an hour is different than ten percent at 100. So uh, my car will do ten percent in second and third, uh, and third will go to 130 miles an hour, and then fourth and fifth will drop to like seven percent, and then six percent and fifth. Um, to try and keep that number as close to as I can be. So, uh, for example, just recently I took my car to the drag strip and I destroyed, uh, the transfer case high point gears. And I was a little frustrated and I did what I tell no customer to do and stayed in it the entire time. I knew as soon as I shifted into second that I broke it because the car sounded like it was pissed off, like <laughs> so bad. I was so hard on the trash control. My RPM trace looks like an EKG, right? <laughs> That's how bad it looks. And I'll send you that picture too if you want to laugh. And I was like, 
this doesn't sound good. Something's going to hurt this, this thing. This doesn't sound talking, good. Let's stay in it. This, let's stay. Yeah, well, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. It's still, it's still, it's still trapped 160, but it was so far off. It was so, so against the traction control that it, it wasn't, it was, it was just, it was not healthy for the engine. Um, that, that slip target number you were talking on the tires there, you were talking some, yeah. what was it? eight ish percent in the lower gears and moving down to five or six in the higher gears. Is that, uh, is is that more, is that coming more from sort of experiment? You guys have some tire data on this. You just sort of trying what works. You try different slip ratios and you just see where you're getting the most drive. So in the, initially when I first did it, I didn't have maybe the data that I have now. I didn't have a, a, an IMU or a GPS. I just had like what felt seat of the pants. And, and at the time it was, half mile racing that I was doing when I first switched to the MoTeC and stuff. So to me, I talked to some people and everyone always said 10% was a good number. And so I just kind of started at 10% and I felt like I went down to 5% and it definitely didn't accelerate as fast. It didn't feel the same. I went to eight and I was like, oh, this feels good. I went to 10. I'm like, oh, this feels real good. And then being it's a front wheel drive car, you don't have to worry about the tail sliding around, right? So I've heard some rear wheel drive cars that 12 to 15%, they're getting really hairy and they're not going any faster. So I feel like the number I came up with after talking to people and also doing that, 10% was a good start. At, mm-hmm. And I would say anything between 10 and 12 miles an hour of slip is about what I thought felt the best to me. And this was, again, when I started back in the day without any real data that I have now. Um, so I would say it was a little bit from listening to what John Reed said. He's like, 10% is a good starting point. And then I would also say the tire you're on might like more slip or less slip if it, and depending on where you're at too. So it kind of varies, but I would say on a Toyo, I've noticed 10% or 10 to 12 miles an hour different at most seems to be a, a pretty quick, the quickest I would say on, on not, on not a drag strip on the street. Yeah. And that's something I was interested in as well is how much does it target slip change going between different tire brands or maybe tire pressures or, or different wheel alignment settings or whatever you might be using. I don't know if you play around with that stuff much, but does that target slip change if you go to a different brand tire much or you find you're more or less in the ballpark? I would say I've, I, if you go to a, a different tire, like let's say an m bias ply slick, that's not a slick, but it's a bias ply street tire, that slip percentage is going to want to be more. And I just think the tire wants to slip more because of how it is. There's so a difference Toyo, between a bias ply and a radial construction. Exactly. So I would say those want more slip. Sure. But those those are not as stable at 200 miles an hour as like a, a hard R comp. And I've I've been running a Toyo for five or six years. And I feel like for the size that they are, they work really, really good. Um, really, really good. I would say Toyo doesn't want anything to do with it because I think I'm like 50 miles over the rated speed that I'm going. <laughs> but uh, I think my tire size is good to 165 and we're not going that fast. We're going quite a bit faster. So call me dumb or questionable, whatever you want to do. So I've been running that tire. So I ran a Toyo R88 first. Then I went to r r I talked to one of the Toyo guys that I met at a, a NASA road race at actually 25 hour Thunder Hill. And I saw him every year at PRI. So I was like, Hey, like what's the new cool tire? And he's like, Oh, we got the new R88 R. He said, you know, here shows me this little sheet and it says, what's well, good for about 3% more slip or it's, it's 3% better than the old Toyo, you know? And I think that's just the design. There's more tire touching the ground. So I started using that and I'm like, Oh, this thing's, this thing is a little better. Then they came out with the Toyo RR, which is a, a DOT race slick. And uh, it's, it's got two grooves down the center. Sure. And I tested that tire back to back at TX2K one year. And the same power, uh, the Toyo r r slipped 4% more on the same track with the same power, with the same everything. So to me, it was the, the, the RR was worth more power, was worth, I could put down more power, right? Sure. Less slip. Yep. So it means I could give it more power sooner. And so I started using those. And I think Underground Racing uses that same tire now. Uh, I talked to them. I'm like, you should try this RR, this Toyo RR. So I'm not going to say I'm a direct salesman for Toyo, but I've spent a lot of time that I feel like for what my car has done to be on the tire that it is. I mean, it went 
213 on a 245 just two tires yeah 245 that's pretty so, impressive yeah do you think yeah. that underground racing need any more advantages though let's be honest they need they they still need more traction it sounds like they still need to figure out how to because if you listen to those cars they're still spinning in fifth yeah. gear sixth gear and it's like you know listening to them and if you watch them from behind too they're they get every shift the the fuel gets darker and darker and darker richer I mean, I, I don't know what fuel are they, they're not on ethanol or straight methanol. I'm pretty sure they're on race gas sure. for a lot of the, or some sort of mix of some sort. So yeah, they, they, you know, they, 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 they had to learn, they had to get there the hard way too. So. Definitely. We all do. Yeah. Let's come back a little bit to my, my favorite topic of, of head gaskets and we'll actually okay. sort of talk about head gaskets and sleeving because sure. th- this is something that we had the advantage with the 4G63 that it was a cast iron block. So uh, while it's not bulletproof in these days, there's billet options for the 4G63 as well. But uh, definitely in comparison to mainstream alloy blocks, there's not too many four-cylinder alloy blocks that you'll punch 11, 1200 wheel without needing to do a lot of work. And we certainly could with the 4G63. So You could, yep. Talk us through what what have you done to the B18C in terms of sleeving for a start, and then we'll get onto the heat gasket. Yeah, so right now it has uh, Darton sleeves. I it, wait, wish so I, I guess say, start by for those who aren't even aware of what that term sleeve is. What, what is it? Yeah. What does it do? What does it replace? And why do we need it? It essentially replaces the entire cylinder wall. It's a it's a reinforced cylinder wall. So factory they have like a a little, I, I'll call it sleeve with, with probably, I think it's like maybe a quarter inch or no, like probably eighth inch of steel and then aluminum on the outside. And the sleeve is, it's an open deck. So nothing's holding the sleeves from moving around at any time factory, but factory in what 94, when my car came out, they're like, oh, it's a 185 horsepower car. We're no Good one's to ever going to try to, no one's ever going to try to make more power with these. So little dip know, on the I, no. Little did Honda know that I wonder what the Honda engineers think, you know, 20 years, 30 years ago, what they were doing, what they're doing now. Like, are they like, yeah, we designed that stuff. Or now it's like, what are they doing? So, um, yeah, so it's, it, you're replacing the cylinders, essentially the cylinder sleeves completely. Yep. So when they put these Darton sleeves in, they literally cut out all the factory sleeves almost. I don't know the exact process, so don't quote me on that, but they cut most of it out and then they press the sleeves in. And these sleeves are significantly thicker, better. I think they're they're iron. I couldn't tell you the exact yeah, combination. Yeah, duct, ductile of, iron typically. Ductile iron, yeah. And these are still a wet sleeve, which means water still still goes around them and goes up through the cylinder. Yep. And when on like your 4G63 back in the day, did you do a solid? Did you do a cement filled or did you have water run through it still? Uh, we, we did both, but for my own car, which is probably the one we pushed the furthest, that was fully uh, cement filled, grout filled right up to the, the deck surface. And we yep. did run water through the cylinder head just for some cooling, but we, you, know, you can get away with a lot of evils when you're running on, on methanol fuel with the cooling properties of that. Um, so yeah, a bit, bit more problematic if you running on gasoline based fuels and definitely if you want to take it to the supermarket, it's probably not going to work that well for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Starbucks, I, I, sorry. Yeah. Starbucks, uh, supermarket, Chipotle. I mean, I've, I've got pictures of it pretty much everywhere. It's, it's funny. <laughs> daily as it driver. Sounds. So, uh, it used to be a daily driver a long time ago. It's far from that. It sits on it. It's actually sitting in the shop right now cause it's broken. So of course it is. Uh, we'll get onto yeah. that. So we'll the, get onto that. Yeah. The other thing yeah, you've sort of explained it, but just for those who aren't aware, so it's not just the sleeve. As you said, in stock form, the B18C is an open deck block, so the sleeves Correct. are not connected to the outside of the block, and that's Correct. fine with stock power. But when you get really high cylinder pressures, first of all, those are going to start moving around, which results in problems with the head gasket integrity and leaking, but also in extreme circumstances, you can end up actually cracking the, the factory liners. So these Darden sleeves replace the factory liners, uh, much thicker, stronger material, mm-hmm. ductile iron. Yep. But they also have this flange on the top, which actually basically locates against the outside of the the block as well. So that's really sort of positively located, and we don't have this problem with them walking around under high cylinder pressure anymore. Well, they still walk. Well, I I found out they still walk around, yeah. uh, but uh, up to a certain power level, of course. Obviously, you know, we used to just do. I used to just have a step deck block. Probably, I think it was two and a half to 3000 step decks. So the sleeve was protruded 
two and a half to three thousandths above the rest of the block. Yep. So when you put a head gasket on it, it's clamping down on that first, sealing the cylinder from the coolant. Obviously, it's still it's still water. Water goes through the block, goes goes through the block, and goes through the head. So. Yep. Um, up to a certain power level, I believe it was somewhere around the 1100 horsepower range, 1120 or something. I, all I had was a step deck block. And then, um, once I got to that power level, I started pushing gaskets and we knew it would come eventually. So then I went to a, an O-ring cylinder head. So we took a stainless steel O-ring, cut a groove in there, mm-hmm. uh, 40, 39, 39, 000, no. 41 thou, 40 or 41 thou wire, and it protrudes, I think it was somewhere around five to six thousandths out of the head, mm-hmm. and then it still used an MLS gasket, and if you talk to Kemetic or any MLS gasket maker, they'll tell you, oh, you can't do an O-ring with these, like they won't work. We've had exactly the same situation, uh, people telling yeah. us that that won't work, but we ran the same, we actually did it the other way around, which you uh, did in the kind block. Of, we did it in the block, which I kind of regret, yep. and I think yeah, I was around six thou protrusion, same yep. same deal, 41 thou Roughly, stainless, yep. stainless wire, and that was into an HK stopper t- type head gasket. Yep. And that, that took us, you know, up to, well, we were still running that at 1200 wheel. So, yeah, and that'll, that'll take you so far. But there's, there's a variety of other techniques. I mean, you see what oh, yeah. top fuel, top alcohol do. That's the stainless wire O-ring in the head. Yep. More protrusion, copper gasket that will deform and then a receiver groove that Correct. the copper gasket gets deformed into in the block yep. or the top of the sleeve. Out of interest, did you ever try that technique? Not on this car. We we do that for the 4G63 stuff. Okay. Um, but I never did because we run water through mine. So yeah. it was one of those things. So I was uh, so I, I went from that to the O ring, yep. and then after the O ring, I got to pretty much last year. I started. I I hadn't had any head gasket problems up to 1300 horsepower, roughly. You know, 55, 60 pounds of boost. I never had any problem. Then I started drag racing it hitting the car sooner or earlier with a lot of power in second, third gear that I never would hit it before since I was, you know, traction limited. Then I started seeing coolant pressures go up and higher and higher. So uh, then we did the fire ring and I did the fire ring a little different, mainly because I already had the O-ring groove cut in the head. Mm -hmm. So I had a fire ring made for the exact size of the O-ring that I had cut in the head. And so then I put the fire ring in the head and put it on the block. Okay, which so let, is the- let's just, for those who aren't aware, and I mean, there's a lot of terminology which people sort of mix and match. So when you're using that term fire ring, what Correct. specifically are you talking about? It is like a, I think it's a copper beryllium, some sort of ring that has a little leg mm-hmm. that locates in either the sleeve or the head. Yep. And then... I think the numbers are between two to three to maybe four thousandths protrusion over whatever your gasket is. Yep. So it's just a it's a metal on metal, um, uh, a metal on metal. Uh, what's the word I want to use? Seal. Seal. Yeah, metal on metal seal for the combustion cylinder. So it's basically you're clamping, you know, you're torquing this head to 100 foot pounds, and you're you're putting this little firing in there and clamping it down and so you hope that nothing gets through that because you're like well if something gets through this then there obviously has to be some serious cylinder pressure going on yeah and i think that that's a technique i i've had a limited amount of experience with it sort of became the norm pretty much after i'd retired my car we, we did it on a couple of shop uh customer cars I mm-hmm. think if I'm, I could be wrong. I think the material is actually an aluminium bronze alloy. It, yes, it is. An, it's, I think I had a ring that we had tested. This is another version of one here too that IAG uses. Uh, yep. it, this, this one looks similar, yep. but this doesn't have the leg on it. This is actually machined right into the sleeve and sits into the inside and the piston goes up on there. Yeah, so it's yeah. a different style. Yeah, what's, I mean the, the, what's the purpose of that leg that you were talking about to locate it? It stops it rotating, or what is this? I, th- I mean, I think it. I think it's an easy way to keep it in there. Um, I think it adds support, but uh, I. I mean, Andre probably has a better. Uh, 
Oh, right. I'm just, I, I think you're pretty much spot on there, just positively yeah. located. I mean, again, that yep. you've got that, all of that cylinder pressure trying to force the, the thing out. There's a variety of techniques. I, I know there's uh, a gasket company that basically do the same sort of thing now, uh, where it's just located physically by the gasket. So there's no one size yeah. fits all those, answer here. Those, those suck to a certain power level. They, they work, but they're not as good as, as I think locating it in because yeah, I've seen them literally blow out right there you know yeah and i think the the crush in it's pretty small too they i think it's an athena gasket actually That's they the have one. like yep. three little small points they do yes. that, and those dig into the head and they work pretty good yeah just once you get to the big power stuff they're not quite as good yeah. um i think it's probably so also I, worth mentioning that those uh aluminium bronze ceiling rings fire rings as you've called them uh, yep. I'm pretty confident as well. Those are being used in uh, the majority of the Pro Mod uh, Turbo drag engines as well. So like, it's it's a very proven technology, and some of those are definitely you know, three, four, about four thousand plus horsepower. I forget now. They're, they're yeah, huge well, numbers. I mean, definitely. I think they're being using in a lot. I, they're not using them in top alcohol, top funny car though. No, they're still using the the, the old if, school. They don't want to change anything. If it isn't they're broken, like, don't works. fix it. <laughs> Well, well, they replace everything every pass anyway. So to them, it's easy to do that. And uh, so, yeah, so I think a lot of the, the newer technology stuff is definitely more um, what let's call it uh, a firing combo for sure. I think the other thing that, that needs to be considered is like some of these small capacity import engines. You know, we've talked about you're making 1400 wheel, the, the GTR is two and a half, maybe 3000 wheel from yep. uh, 4.1 liters or whatever they might be. But the specific power levels are, are incredibly high. And it's and that per um, cylinder too. Yeah. And the, the combustion pressure again is what we're fighting against here. So you sort of have to keep it in perspective. We talk about some of these pro mod engines where we've got a lot more capacity, um, obviously more cylinders as well. With the sleeving as well, I know that we, we do go through the sleeving process because we're trying to fix this problem with the yep. liner strength. We're trying to stop the things moving around and improve the head gasket integrity. Yet uh, here in New Zealand and people I talk to all around the world, it's so prevalent that they go through that process, which is expensive and time consuming, uh, yep. and then get the engine up and running. And we go through this, this problem of what's referred to as the the uh, sleeves dropping, which is where they yep. might move down after everything's heat cycled. They might drop by two or three thousandths of an inch. And, and then of course the heat gasket That's leaks, all you need. which That's is all you need. then kind of creating one of the problems we're trying to fix. Now you can get around that, pull everything apart and, and redeck the block. And generally once the, the sleeve is moved once, it kind of seems to stay put. So you're good to Correct, go. Yeah. But obviously yeah. that creates a second rebuild, a huge amount of mm -hmm. time and expense. So yep. how, how are you getting around this? Obviously you've sleeved your own block and through English Racing, you're sleeving 4B11. So what's the secret sauce here in getting a, a one and done approach to sleeving? I don't necessarily think there's a secret sauce. I think it's leave it to the leave leave the sleeving to the machine shops or the the manufacturers that do sleeving for a living the guys who design the sleeves to be used so you know we use darton uh darton sleeves and darton east uh or ar fabrication howard so he's been sleeving blocks for who knows how long and he knows what it what how to sleeve a block correctly now i don't know what a lot of these people are doing maybe the the press is is not enough and as an engine warms up the clearances open up a little and that sleeve drops, you know, hmm. um, I, I know we had an issue with a GTR billet block that we got at one point that, um, the sleeves were installed incorrectly from what I remember hearing. And Howard said pretty much you open, you put that block in a, at a hundred at 150 degrees Fahrenheit and the sleeves literally, you just pull them right out. You know, they had very little press in them. And so, sure we always felt like a step deck sleeve is the way to go. If it's a flat deck sleeve, it, it's never going to hold, at least with a wet block, it's never going to hold. And so we're always, you know, two to three thousandths in, in, in a step. And then I don't know what the parameters are for installing the sleeves. If they're with a press, how much press they have. I don't know those aspects, but I've always been, don't just buy your sleeves on eBay and go to your mom and pop uh, machine shop down the road and say, hey, can you install these sleeves for me? Because yeah. I would say 95% of the time it's going to be done incorrectly. 
I, I do remember, I think it was a Do It For A Living podcast that Howard from AR Fab was on and there was a bit of a conversation about that and I seem to recall at the time uh, he's using the best of the best gear. It's all, all CNC boring equipment, which obviously mm-hmm. makes sense when you're working to those tolerances. And I'm not a yeah. machinist. I do remember talking to the machinist we used to use through my old shop and had done a few sleeving jobs and, and had had mixed success. Uh, manual mm-hmm. boring equipment, which obviously requires yep. a lot more skill from the machinist. Not Correct. to say you yeah. can't get the results, but yeah. The, the point he raised, which I hadn't really thought about, is you're – removing so much material from the block and its alloy with a high thermal expansion coefficient Mm -hmm. and physically machining out all of that material creates a huge amount of heat so the block itself during the 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 boring process is actually uh going to change its dimensions so i i don't know maybe there's something in that but again i'm not a machinist and i definitely don't install sleeves but public service announcement if you're getting your sleeve your block sleeve Make sure to the guys who know. Make sure you're using <laughs> someone who's got some runs on the board, and it's probably yeah. going to save you from uh, sort of problems further down the track. Exactly. Yeah, I would say so. I would. I would agree. I mean, I've had, you know, uh, I don't think I've personally ever had an issue with any sleeves. I, I mean, I've gone from a Golden Eagle to a Darton sleeve, and I've never had any issues with Golden Eagle. I do always hear people talk about, like you were saying, with once your engine's together and it goes through a first heat cycle, normally the sleeves settle a little bit, probably a half a thousandth yep. is, is kind of the number that we see when we put it back together. And when we, when we take it apart, we see that. And, you know, if I, like you said, I, I don't know what it is in the clearance that they do or how they do it exactly, but like you pay the right people to do it and just let them do it. I think that's probably advice that could be applied to a, a lot in the, the motorsport lot. industry to be Oh fair. yeah. Yeah, exactly. For sure. Definitely. One of the questions I've had in my mind for a little bit here is about the difference between a B series and a K series. In the Honda world, you hear, I mean, K series is the rage. It seems to be what everyone is using for everything. So what is it about a B series that maybe makes it a bit more suitable for this application? This is about because what you've got more experience with, or is there actually something different in the inherent design of the engine that makes it more suitable for what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, you could... The K and the B in different aspects, I mean, the, the B series came as a 1.8 liter dual overhead cam and a, a very, you know, VTEC that uh, when the K series, they come as a two liter and a 2.4 liter. So they're already a bigger motor. They're at probably 10 to 15 years newer technology. So you're already dealing with a bigger motor. You're already dealing with newer technology. You're dealing with a gear driven oil pump on the bottom versus like a the one my, I have is like a gear inside of the crank. So you're dealing with a lot newer technology. And so in the all motor application and in just, uh, I'd say even the same turbo application to a certain extent, the K is a better motor. I mean, there's no doubt, like people are making what 700, 800 horsepower naturally aspirated now in uh, K series motors with nitro on top. And we're talking like 2.5 liter, 2.7 liter motors making 700 horsepower on a dyno i mean that's just that's crazy unheard of so i would say the k is a more efficient motor um when it comes to making the power naturally aspirated um to this day though the fastest sport front wheel drive cars which are all around specific rules you know 2400 or 25 2450 weight you know pounds and then they're limited to a 7285 and you're talking to about yeah, just to turbo yep yeah, yep yeah. 72 millimeter uh inducer and i think 85 or i think they have a 106 or some i don't know the exact numbers of how big they can go but they're turbo limited and all of the turbo limited classes the b series cars are still faster um and i couldn't necessarily tell you why because i've never had a k i've my car came with the b series and i kind of started with the b and i I'm going to end with the B. It sounds like uh, as much money as I've thrown at it now. I, I, I was, you know, if I did a K series, my all wheel drive would have been a lot easier and probably not as expensive because the, the transfer cases are a little bigger on the K series stuff. So everything about them, they, they make more power easier, but when it comes to the very end of the limit, make the most power for the turbo you have, I, I, Maybe it's just the B series game's been around a lot longer and that combo's more perfected, but I don't think there are any seven second front wheel drive K series SFWD cars yet. And there's at least eight to 10 
mm. B series. It's so, interesting. I, I, I've never tuned a B series or a K series that's anywhere near that power level. But I mean, in the naturally aspirated stuff and the mild turbo stuff, I mean, everything I have the, seen so far, pound for pound of boost. The K series destroys it. Absolutely. So it's interesting yeah, that, that that kind of doesn't hold to the 1400 plus wheel horsepower. But I mean, the, the proof's it's, out there. So yeah, it'd be well, interesting kinda, to know a little bit more. It's kind of like the Evo 10, like the Evo 10 at low power, the 4 11 at low power, same turbo. It destroys a 4 uh, a 4G63 in my eyes. You know, you hmm. stock motor, put the right turbo on it. You're making 450, 500 horsepower without opening or touching the entire hmm. motor. When on a 4G63, you got to do camshafts to be able to, you know, a Evo 8 versus Evo 9. If you do an Evo 8, the cams are smaller than an Evo 9. So you struggle to make the power easier as in a 4B11. And now we get to the big power stuff and the 4G63 still makes more power on our dyno and goes faster than the 4B11 does. But the the power band that Evo 10 has is like retarded compared to the 4G63. We're talking, Luke, Luke had a dyno pull we did when we did, we literally pulled wastegate line 100% duty cycle it made 85 pounds of boost at 5,400 RPMs. And the same turbo, the same fuel, the same pretty much gear ratio on the Ford, on our drag Evo 8, it made 19 pounds of boost at that same boost, line, at that same wow. RPM. Yeah, that, that sounds probably a bit more realistic with what I'd expect. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I would say maybe the power band and, and it just maybe it consumes the turbo sooner, I guess is the easiest way to say it. It, it, it throws everything at it as soon as possible and it gets there quick, but it, it doesn't have the very top end, uh, sure. uh, you know, is kind of the only way I, I don't have enough experience with the K series. The guys I talk to say they need 10 millimeters more turbo to go just as fast. Yeah. With that's the same. interesting. So yeah. right. let's just talk a little bit. You've alluded to it a bunch of times now, but, but one <laughs> of the changes you've made uh, this year, I think it's this year uh, is the four wheel drive conversion. And I mean, you're Correct. definitely, you're definitely not the first to do this in the yeah. Honda drag racing world. But, um, can you talk us through just real brief view of like what parts, cause using OE parts for this, what, what do you need to actually do a four wheel drive conversion? Yeah, so being my car is a B series, you 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 have to go back to like the only all wheel drive B series cars that were ever made were, you know, Honda CRBs. So ninety seven to two thousand one, mm -hmm. they came with a B twenty, and mm -hmm. they came with a, a. The way they would work is the minute the front would slip, the front tires would slip. It would like activate an oil pump, I believe, that would then send power to the rear. So um, that factory didn't have a viscous or anything. It has. Okay. I, I think it has a, a little oil pump. I, I, I wish I knew more about the how the CRV works, but essentially it was the only car that you could buy that was a B-series that had a transfer case hung on and mm. a rear diff and, and a drive line. So my car is a B-series, so it uses a 99 CRV transfer case. And then I've got an 89 Civic uh, Wagavan rear differential in it, which is, seems to be the strongest differential so far, even out of a, I mean, we're talking a four, 30, 30 something year old car and the parts, if you can find them are seeming to be the most, the most robust. And obviously all of these parts came off Honda's showroom floor and 1400 Correct. wheel horsepower applications, right? So they're, they're rated yeah, for the every, power you make. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, so good. they're, they're definitely not rated for that amount, but, uh, so, and then I have a, uh, 89 civic, uh, viscous coupler in the middle. So I have, um, I have a transfer case, then I have a drive shaft shop, two piece carbon drive line, and then there's a viscous right in the middle with, it has right now it has 60 K fluid in it is what they call it. It's like a s silicone fluid and the, the thicker the fluid, the more power, or the less slip you have in the viscous, the thinner, the fluid, the more slip you have. Okay. Um, it has a five-speed dog box in it, which I've got the first five-speed dog box right now. Everyone else has only had a four-speed. Well, of course, my half mile, I'm not gonna, I'm mm. not gonna try and go 220 miles an hour of four gears. I want five gears, right? Yep. So, um, so it's a custom five-speed dog box, and then uh, Speed Factory Racing did these billet bell housings because they were the first to do a big power uh, B series all-wheel drive car in uh, in Ostrom four-door civic which i think so far has been like 770 and 190 okay 
and I, I don't know what power he makes, but he says it's, he says I'm, I'm his little, I'm his little, I'm a son compared to him as far as power. So, yeah, okay. uh, so I kind of copied all the stuff they did to an extent. Um, obviously I went with a different manufacturer on the transmission and the same with the transfer gear. So I guess the way to, obviously on Evos, you have a center diff that kind of helps front to rear power. Well, the easiest way I can explain this is this direct drive with the mm. viscous in the middle. And the viscous is what determines the power that goes to the rear. Okay. Now, is, is this a, a problem in terms of how much power you can put through to the rear? I mean, the, the likes of Proyonto Racing that we've interviewed where they're drag racing these four-wheel drive Hondas, uh, they're really setting the cars up still like a front-wheel drive drag car. Correct. And from my understanding, I, I can't remember if the number is exactly right, but I think we're talking something like 30% talk to the to the rear uh so it's only really a little bit of power going to the to the back so what, what's your sort of what have you found so far yeah so i i kept hearing this 20 or 30 percent number and i was like well how could it be 30 is it 30 percent at 500 horsepower is it 30 percent at a thousand or 15 because if it's a set percentage the more power you make that number is going to go up right mm -hmm. So, of course, with the fluid that I had and with the dyno that we have, I'm like, well, I want to know exactly how much power this thing's actually making. So we delink, we unlink the dyno. So front and rear dyno rollers are unlinked. So they, they accelerate what we did, disproportional to each other. Mm -hmm. So one can accelerate faster than the other. So we put it on the dyno, uh, tried to make as close to 1,000 horsepower as I could, and um, it made 975, and it made... 50, about 50 percent front to rear power okay and i only made 975 and the rear made i think 520 and the front made 508 okay and it slipped the tires a little in the front didn't strap it down because i don't think we expected it to make the power it did to the rear so when i put it on the dyno and we made this 500 horsepower and i think it was 320 foot pounds of torque i'm like this is way too much power I'm like there's no wonder these people or people are breaking these things so at that point right then and there, I knew that at, with that fluid on the dyno, it was more than 30% power to sure. the rear. I mean, at that point, we came up with just about 50%. And you can see the rear wheel speed was slower. So the, it wasn't like the, the ramp, the torque curve was more smooth to the rear or the power number was more smooth, but actually put more power to the rear than the front on the dyno. And I think that's just because it just spun the tires a little more in the front. I didn't strap it down yeah. as hard. So, so is that is that a problem for you in terms of getting the car down the strip, <laughs> or are you worried more about the strength of these low spec OE parts failing on uh, you with too much power? Yeah. So, I mean, pretty much seven launches in, I'm already broken my OEM parts <laughs> on the car. So, at four wheel uh, drive life. Correct. Yeah. So, on an Evo, we have a transfer case with a ring and pinion that's like seven eight inches wide, right? So your power is going through that Well, yeah. on this on the honda i mean it's that the the gear that it's putting all there's two gears about this big that's putting all that power to the rear too uh, the hypoid gear they call it and well on the b series those are smaller and well like i said seven launches it it broke that gear already now in hindsight i threw out as my my one coworker says i threw the kitchen sink at it in the launch because i think it was like 50 pounds of boost in first gear that it ended up making uh so it was like 1200 something horsepower with the motex set and as soon as Hard i shifted believe. second it just went yeah. broke and uh so it was too much power but it still comes down to we want to set the car up more like a front wheel drive car i want to actually have the trash control do something i want a little bit of push from the rear i don't want i don't want an evo power i don't want an evo 50 50 because we don't have evo uh parts as far as uh power or, or, or big enough parts so yeah, it's it's too much already. So, when you you said your the transfer case you're using in the center is CRV, the rear is an older yeah. <clears throat> Civic. What are you doing as far as treating these things before they go in? Is it is it literally a case of maybe giving it some fresh seals and some oil and sending it, or I mean, are you yeah. taking these things apart and special surface treatments and clearances and blah blah blah? What are you doing to these things? Yeah, so I forgot to mention I have a, a billet transfer case. So the case itself is billet, not OEM, because mm -hmm. it sounds like it would have definitely broke really quick had I had not put that in. So the transfer case, the billet transfer case seems to hold everything together a lot better. There's, it's like a billet block. It's more rigid. It's, it's got more, uh, 
it's just stronger in yeah. that aspect. So that's OEM or that's sorry, that's not OEM. Those hypoid gears, which basically sends the power to the rear, those are the only OEM parts in there. There's a transfer gear that has a. I mean, shit, I could have brought those parts in here, showed them all because uh, they're just sitting on the shelf right now. Um, so those things, they have a transfer gear that rides off the differential in the transmission. So that sends the power. It's like direct drive right off of the uh, transmission differential itself. And so that is an aftermarket piece too. You'd pretty much break that right away. So that's a, I now have a PPG transfer gear mm -hmm. uh, that's going in the car because I, I broke the other one already yeah. and uh, the other aftermarket one. The rear differential is pretty much OEM ring and pinion. Uh, it's pretty crazy. It's it's pretty small. I compared it next to a GTR, like an R35 front differential ring and pinion, damn near the same size actually. Okay. So and we've seen 600 horsepower to the front on one of those before uh, if you do upgraded clutches and dyno it like I just did. So there uh it's pretty big and then i put a, a limited slip in the rear so it has a limited slip in the rear instead of a factory open diff yeah um so uh it 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 pushes normal and when you start to turn you can kind of feel that it's got a little more drag in it than it would as a front wheel drive car yeah uh, but other than that the ring and pinion are factory and those hypoid gears are the two factory components that I feel like are going to be the next breaking point. Well, I've already broke the one part, so. Well, look, Miles, I, I think we could probably spend another hour chatting to you, and, and maybe we'll come mm -hmm. back and revisit this another time. But for now, I think we 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 want to be want to respect your time and uh, probably sure. move towards wrapping this up. I and mean, one more point yeah. on on the Integra. Obviously, this four-wheel drive thing is a relatively new development. You said you've gone two thirteen uh, on the half so far. Uh, what sort of end game do you see? Where's the where's the limit? Where do you expect to be once you've got this four wheel drive set up, dialed in? You can feed it some more power. Where, where do you see yourself going? You mentioned two twenty. Is that sort of the target for now? I think two twenty was was one of the goals. Uh, really, two twenty five is that goal right now. Um, as crazy as it sounds, uh, that's kind of my dream to go two twenty five and a half mile, and and I think one hundred and eighty in the quarter unprepped. Uh, so 225 is my my uh, 225 is my current goal, and I am going to a half mile event in about three weeks. So okay. I'll we'll see if I break something again, or if I, you know, who knows what's going to happen there. I'm I'm hoping that it goes faster than 213, um, but obviously it's so new. I've, I think I pulled the tranny out of this thing eight times already this year, so uh, it's 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 pretty new, and it's 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 a bit of a. I'm, I, I'm losing, not losing motivation, but I'm definitely, I'd rather be on the jet ski than work <laughs> on my car most of the time these days. So I do, I do remember that it gets pretty disillusioning when you're spending more time hanging on the end of a yeah. spanner than you are uh, driving the car down the drag strip. And yes. the old saying goes, we spend more and more money on our cars to spend less and less time in the driver's seat, which <laughs> is sadly yeah. true. doesn't make a lot of sense, but uh, yeah. unfortunately that uh, drag racing bug bites pretty hard as well. Yeah. Um, one of the questions we, we like to ask our guests is looking back at your career so far if mm -hmm. you were to give advice to someone a younger version of yourself looking to get to where you have <laughs> in the performance industry what would be your advice what what should they be doing oh man uh i would probably the one thing that i didn't do that i should have done is i should have just did a sleeved motor since it, day one okay i went through stock sleeve motor, all that. I went through so many different variations that if I'd have just spent the money and done the motor right the first time, I probably would have saved myself about three motors. Uh, and so if, if it was me, just spend the money up front to do the motor correctly. Because once you've got the motor done, because everyone's like, oh, I got a fully built motor, but I got stock sleeves. Well, that's useless. You know, I think so you're basically describing your worst nightmare customer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were that guy. Uh, I, you know, I added up the other day how much it would cost to duplicate the Integra to the T. It's pretty, pretty sad. It's, it's never, never grand. added up is my advice. It was, <laughs> never if someone wanted up. to duplicate the car, how it sat right now, it'd be $100,000 in just parts. 
it's, yeah, it's pretty sad. Yeah, yeah, I think that's the other aspect. <laughs> Coming back to that quest- question I asked a, a while Are back. Are you ready and, to spend the money? Well, yeah, that that's sort of, you know, we see these big numbers being thrown around on the internet. It's not just mm-hmm. the reliability, which I also mentioned, but you know, people don't actually really have an appreciation for exactly what it's going to cost to costs. get your car yeah. to that point with some yes. level of reliability. Correct, yes, yeah. I mean, you can make the power once and you can shoot a different ECU and you could do a lot of stuff, but to duplicate something that's proven and works and I could pretty much duplicate a car for someone and tell them it'll make this power and it'll survive down the track at least one day. Uh, it, it's, it's a big amount of money that most people aren't ready for. So, yeah. If uh, people want to follow you and see what you're up to, what's the best place to see what, what you're doing on the socials? Yeah, I would say the easiest place is Instagram, which is at gringo, G-R-I-N-G-O. Tegra, T-E-G-R-A. Uh, I grew up in the Dominican Republic and I was called gringo. Of course, you know, when you grow up in another country and you're the minority, they figure out a name and call you and gringo was the name. And I had an Integra, so gringo Tegra just kind of worked and it's sat since there. So yep. uh, that's the easiest place is Instagram. And English racing, uh, anyway, we can see what's going on there. Yeah, same, same thing, English uh, underscore racing on Perfect. Instagram and, and also Facebook. And then obviously... Uh, Miles Kerr on Facebook, which is M Y L E S, last name K E R R. Uh, you can follow me on there. I usually share the same amount on both of them. So. Perfect. Oh, you might be inundated with new followers. You, you never know your luck. Yeah. Yeah. Look, you, really you appreciate guys have a good following. Really appreciate your time today, Miles, and we wish you all the best. Uh, striving for that 225 mile an hour. Yeah. Half mile. <laughs> Maybe we'll catch up after that and, and get a bit of a rundown on, on how it all went. So thanks again. Yeah. I, I appreciate it and I'll, I'll keep you up to date. Thank you for having me. Cheers, Miles. Thank you. All right. Nice to meet you. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 dollars off the purchase of your first course you'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses important to mention that when you purchase a course from us that course is yours for life as well it never expires you can rewatch the course as many times as you like whenever you like the purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership that gives you access to our private members only forum which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code podcast75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Nice. Got there in the end.